This session will be recorded, so I've started to re the recording there, and we are just delighted to have you. Um, our guest speakers today are Brittany and Cal. They are the co-founders of Everyday Speech. They are, I think like one of those things to me where I just love people who love what they do, and then I truly admire people who love what they do so much that they figure out a way to make it accessible for others. And I definitely think that Brittany and Cal are somebody who embodies this idea. I'm delighted to hear what they have to share with us. We have three of our top clinicians, um, speech language pathologists from Iluma who will be speaking as well, Megan Beaver, Rachel Keener, and Erin Nelson. Iluma Online Therapy is a premier provider of live and online therapy ser services. We provide speech therapy, school psychology, counseling, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and assessments. We're founded in 2011. Um, and through all of that time, we've really tried to embody the idea of providing quality services and a high quality to students across the nation. Without any pause, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to Megan Beaver as she's prepared some of her strategies that she uses to get quality content. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, one thing that I wanted to kind of start out with tonight is talking a little bit about where to go once you um, join the field of telepractice. And I have been a telepractice uh, practitioner for four years. And in the beginning, um, it's a big world and there's a very um, decent learning curve involved. And one of the first things you need is something to do with your students while you're online and you're targeting their goals. And um, it's sometimes difficult when you type in what you're looking for on Google and Google gives you all of the things in no particular order. Um, and then you also sometimes will lean into your peers or your coworkers and ask for suggestions on materials that might be good for um, kind of getting your startup on telepractice. And those um, requests are often met with many, many um, referrals of um, websites or materials or emails with files attached. And so sometimes that request can be really overwhelming. One thing that I think is um, really important to look at when you're gathering materials is something that has um, multi-use purposes and also has like longevity to it. It has a long-term use. Sometimes when we're in a bind and a session might be going sideways and you need a material, or sometimes if you are just out of materials, you might do a search and find something that maybe um, provides you one session worth of activities. And while that fills that really quick need, um, it becomes a lot more time effective um, for you to find materials that you can use in multiple different ways and that can um, scaffold on one another or last for more than one session. So I'm going to give a quick example of something that I use that I really appreciate. Um, I have a articulation um, file and this articulation file has words that, um, words in every sound in every position. They have those targets in, at the phrase level. They also have the targets at the sentence level and they have the targets at the story level. The packet that I use also includes pictures at the word level. So for me, it's really nice to be able to work through any sound in any position at any level. Um, and that is the longevity that I'm talking about. My goal is to see those kids succeed and get further along in their skills. And this um, file that I use does that for me. Another thing that's nice is because there are pictures with my file for those words, I can go just to the picture sections and I can work on um, verb agreement. I can work on um, narrating the situation that's in the picture. I can work on determining emotions. And so not only is it my articulation um, packet or file that I have on my computer, it is also a multi-use um, thing that I can turn to when I need to target multiple things. And so I really want to encourage people that when they are looking for websites, files, uh, materials, is that you really go and put the time in to search and find the ones that have the most bang for their buck. Um, 
it is easy to kind of lean in and sometimes grab those one time use ones and they're great to fill that need sometimes, but we're all busy, we all have notes to write. And so being able to use the same document for many, many different reasons is really important. Thanks. Thank you so much, Megan. I will now introduce our next Illuma speaker and that is going to be Rachel Keener. Hello, um, I'm Rachel Keener. I am a speech language pathologist. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I kind of have a little slide deck. Uh, I pick it by, I'm piggybacking off of what Megan said a little bit in that when looking for content, you want to make sure that your content has multiple uses. And for me, um, the quickest thing to go to that has multiple uses are books and literature. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you and go through this. Um, I've always been passionate about books. I've always been passionate about um, teaching and using books during my therapy sessions. So this needed to translate for me onto the teletherapy platform as well. Um, when you begin to look for books for therapy services, there are several things that you should look for in a book. First of all, is it relatable to children? Um, is it something that they can relate to you and understand and does it have meaning for them specifically um is it versatile so what all skills when you look at a certain book can you target with that book can you pull specific vocabulary what sentence structure targets can you use or pull from that book um, what comprehension questions are there any types of sentence structures that allow for expansions and student practice um, are the pictures and the content such that students can make predictions? Um, and what kind of discussions can be centered around the topics in that book? Um, is it just specific to what is in the book or can it be expanded to things that happen in their everyday lives? Um, word banks are super important from books as well. You can use those for um, articulation skills as well as your vocabulary, as well as even um, content that the student is studying in the classroom. And then another thing to look at is in the book, are there, op are there ample opportunities for the students to participate in the actual um, reading of the story and the story walk and things like that? So there are different ways that you can use books in your mixed groups because, you know, in, in a perfect world, we would have two students who have language goals together and then students with articulation goals together and they would have similar goals and that's just not the reality of therapy, especially not now when oftentimes you're not allowed to pull students from two different classrooms and you're not allowed to um, have different schedules with students and things like that. So you oftentimes do have students with language needs and articulation needs in the same group. So how can you take that one book and that one activity and that one piece of material and make it applicable for both students? So for articulation, there's various things you can do. You can have your student go through if you have time and have them look for their target sound. You can create word banks ahead of time so that while you're reading it, you can stop and have your student practice. Um, you can look through the book and have um, certain pictures ready to go with the student that they would practice with their target sounds. Language, there's a whole variety of things that you can do. You can focus on WH questions, predictions, vocabulary, um, anything basically language skill related, you can pull from stories. For your students who have fluency skills, um, this is a great opportunity for them to practice their fluency strategies while reading or retelling the story um, and also if you have students who have fears of speaking aloud this is a great time for them to work on their fluency strategies and conquer that fear as well and then social skills always are great you can choose books that have um character problem resolutions. You can guide discussions with your students about appropriate and not appropriate choices for resolution. Some of my favorite books to use are these. 
Um, I have used these repeatedly, especially No David. It is one of my favorite stories for children. The text is very simple, and even the students that I've had that have very limited um, verbal expression do great with No David because it's something they hear every day. No, 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 no. And so for them, it's highly relatable. And it's mostly a picture book so that the students go through and there's so much happening in these pictures that you can really guide some really good language discussions with this book. Um, Where the Wild Things Are, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, all of these books here are some of my favorite. The Wonky Donkey is wonderful for rhyming. Um, every page in that book builds on the Wonky Donkey and each of the pages um, each of the texts builds with different rhyming words. So you can really focus on that um, aspect of language. So adapting this for telepractice. Okay, so it's super awkward to be on camera trying to hold a book and peek around it and things like that. And so what I like to do is use my Kindle app on the iPad and then share it through Zoom. That also allows you to go ahead before you begin your story, you can do a book walk with your student like you would with a hardback or paperback book. Um, you can also give control of the um, annotation device, excuse me, the annotation feature on Zoom. You can give that to the students that control and oftentimes you can have them circle items or draw in the book or circle their sounds and um, you can make your books more interactive that way. Um, there is just a plethora of things that you can do with literature and therapy and so for me. Um, books are one of my go to therapy items when I'm looking for something that is. Um, scout you know able to be scaffolded um able to be sustainable um and able to um, target various different skills in a specific session so thank you all right well thank you so much rachel i definitely wrote down a couple of the books that you shared today so that i can look them up and i can add them to my wish list of literature so I, I love a good children's book in all honesty. I'm now excited to introduce our next speaker, Erin Nelson. She's another SLP at Iluma Online Therapy, and she's prepared to share some of the strategies that she also uses. All right, hello, hello. Um, I would like to start by saying thank you for being here. Um, I think like so many of us, I'm excited to hear what Brittany and Cal have to say. And um, I am not new to teletherapy this year, but I started in July of 2019. So I still kind of consider myself a little bit of a rookie. And um, I quickly learned that um, time is money, but that time is also non-refundable. And um, I got into teletherapy for two reasons, one of them, for me, the passion of reaching students who might not otherwise have access to services. Um, that was um, really important to me. And I learned about it when I was working in early intervention. Um, and, you know, then realizing that there were so many districts out there that weren't really able to well serve their students because they didn't, you know, their caseload numbers were just so high. And so, um, learning about Iluma and joining the team um, kind of allowed me to meet that need. And then the other one was, I was missing out on time with my family when I was commuting to school and doing that. And so I just wanted to find a way that I could save time, be with my family more and reach some more students. And so I wanna share with you guys a couple of ways that I have found um, that have helped me without spending hours upon hours delving into um, planning. So one of the first things that I wanna do is share the lesson plan template that I have come up with that has helped me um, to shrink my lesson plan timing down by far. So I um, have, when I'm lesson planning, I figure out my plan, I have, um, I put it in the template and then I can just click on it. 
I usually do like all of my students that I have in a chunk of time. And then I, so I might have like seven or eight tabs open. And then when I have a break, I close all of those windows out and go to the next ones. So I have some of these um, lesson plans changed to a red font and some of them highlighted in green. So the ones that I have in red show me that I did not get to that plan during that session time. So I can then grab that and put it in next to next week's lesson plan. And the ones that are highlighted in green, I know that I completed those, so I will not plan those again. Um, and that has really helped me with my organization um, because I was spending hours trying to comb back through what I had done, what would go well with that next, and now I can just take a quick peek and move on. Um, I also ha just label my lesson plans by week and then at the end of the month I throw them all into a folder that is you know labeled for that month that also um, I also help myself with tracking attendance that way um, because I typically write I took the notes out of there for the red ones because I didn't want you guys to see any personal information but why students missed sessions are also in those. Um, and then, so Megan mentioned kind of those, those plans that we might have to grab quickly that are good for one session or, um, you know, and in, I will admit that in the beginning, when I first started this last July, that's what I was doing. I was just searching and grabbing and trying my best to find lessons. And um, I have bins and bins of speech materials in my garage and I was spending lots of time not only searching on the internet but kind of scanning things in and taking pictures of things and figuring out ways that I can convert could convert those to being online materials because when I first started I was working with middle and high school students and so having them bring you know find a toy to bring to a session was not going to be realistic so what I did was I just created lots of files so that those things that I did find and could use one time wouldn't just be for one time so I organized them pretty well but if I found something and I couldn't didn't have time to do that I threw it into my lessons to be sorted file so that when I did have a minute if I had a no show or at the end of the day I could go in open it up and find where it should go um, and put it in the right place and that has also been something that has been really helpful to me so that I don't lose those things that I spend time doing or spend time finding. Okay, so another big thing for me, when I first started, I was so afraid of subscriptions and memberships. I just could not, I, I don't know, the, the whole idea of possibly spending money on a subscription or a membership just weighed on me. But once again, time is money and it's non, time is non-renewable or non-refundable. So I jumped in and I found some that I really, really enjoyed. Um, a couple of the, the ones that I do pay for and that are invaluable for my, for my interactions with my students are IXL and I use language arts for that. Um, everyday speech, I'm, I'm sure Brittany and Cal will share a lot of that um, about that with us, um, and boom cards. And I will say with boom cards, I do, um, I search weekly for new free decks. And so I use a lot of those. But if I find um, an author who creates quality stuff, I will um, invest in some good stuff that I can use um, with a lot of my students. And then of course, Teachers Pay Teachers puts out a lot of good stuff too. And those are transferable, not just on teletherapy, but that, you know, if I do see a client in a different um, realm, I can use those materials as well. Um, just like Rachel, I love literature and therapy. And so I use Epic Books, books for Kids. And this year um, I was able to get a free membership because of COVID. I think they're still doing that. So if that's something that you're interested in, definitely check it out. They have lots of great books out there. Um, and then also I have created a 
green screen. It is totally makeshift. I went to the I went to Hobby Lobby and got some green felt and wrapped it around a flattened cardboard box that I hung over a drying rack. And that's my green screen, but it works. I don't do the fancy thing where I click through a bunch of different things. I keep it on one and I put, you know, some stuff up on it. And so far it has worked beautifully with my preschool students. And then, um, oh yeah, the children love the books. I had to throw a little, <laughs> a little love for Elf in there um, with um, the books. I should have put that in when I talked about epic books. Sorry about that. Um, and then really another thing that I want to share is just to keep it simple. Right now I work with a lot of preschoolers and so I just always have books on hand. I have my magic box that I'll show you the, where I will shake it and pull out something just totally awesome and cool and they can guess what it is. They're always related to whatever targets that the, you know, the students have, even though they don't know it. Um, and so that, you know, I think I've gone over a lot of stuff. Subscriptions, organization, keeping it simple, and reading books are the main things that I would recommend. I think that's all I have to share. I hope you guys have a wonderful night, and I can't wait to hear from Everyday Speech. Thanks, guys. I just got a smile, even myself, when you pulled out your magic box. So <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much, Erin. Without any hesitation, I'm just delighted to have Cal and Brittany and to hear what they have prepared and shared. Um, Cal and Brittany, go ahead and unmute yourselves and, and welcome. Hi, everyone. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we have a couple slides and then we also just decided um, the product is is the best best way to it speaks for itself. It's just so visual that um, that's that we'll, we'll, go, we'll jump into the product as well. So um, we'll start with a little bit about us and then we'll go into the product. So I'm just going to share my screen here and I'm going to be going back and forth. I apologize about that. Um, so I should have my slides. Great, so we are going to start off with just um, the basics, who we are and uh, how we got started. So I'm Cal um, and this is my wife, Brittany, who's a speech pathologist. So I'll let her take away what she did before everyday speech because that's a lot more interesting than what I did. <laughs> sure, so um, my first job after college, I worked at a collaborative. So I spent most of my time working uh, just at a high school. And then um, a couple days a week, I also went into um, self-contained classrooms uh, for younger kids. So it was really nice. I was seeing kind of the very opposite ends of the spectrum um, in all sense of that word, because I was working very, very closely. Um, and most of my caseload ended up by chance, I think, just to be students who were on the spectrum. Um, and that really led us uh, to our aha moment, but I'll let Cal talk about what he did before we started Everyday Speech. Yeah, so I was working as a B2B tech consultant. Um, so a consulting firm, basically what we did is we worked with B2B uh, software companies looking to break into new markets or um, get uh, venture capital funding. And so we would do um, market diligence basically. So uh, their price point, who their competition was, their market penetration, feature analysis, kind of everything you might need to know for like a go-to-market strategy, uh, I was working on. And so um, I always kind of had the itch to not do it for other people and maybe do it for myself. And uh, that's that's sort of a, a little bit of where we started. And Brett was um, using technology a lot in the classroom. So do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was 2012. And I think, you know, the iPad coming out really revolutionized special education, education itself. Um, so I was, you know, very much so excited to use my iPad, look at all the speech therapy apps and I'd come home and I would show them to Cal and I kind of became um, the AT person as well. So doing a lot of assistive technology consults um, in my district, um, just because I was so excited and I just, you know, all of the new uh, evals coming up, I just wanted to jump on them and take them on. So I did. Um, and that really led me to looking into, you know, everything that was out there at the time. Um, I already mentioned that my caseload was primarily social skills students. And I, you know, I saw a couple things. I saw how um, impactful using technology in the iPad was or hooking it up to the smart board was um, 
for high schoolers across my caseload, across the board, um, just how motivated they were when I took out that iPad or, you know, again, hooked it up to the smart board for the whole class. And then I also was reading about the impact of video modeling. And I was really thinking about um, how could I make these videos myself and then balancing with, well, that is so time consuming. Who has time? You know, you're trying to either find the right videos on YouTube, which has a whole myriad of problems that come with it, finding appropriate things, watching them, making sure that ads, which you have no control over, are okay for the students. Um, and yeah, really making them apply to the exact scenario you are trying to build in the therapy room with your student. Um, so from there, we really had that aha moment of, I was like, there's something here with technology. There's something here with video modeling. I think we could do this for ourselves and save therapists out there so much time. And that's what we did. Yep. So our, our, we launched in 2014 um, with an iPad app called Let's Be Social. Um, so it was basically social stories with illustrated drawings. And then we also had um, the ability to create your own social stories because that's sort of what we heard from everyone. You know, my students are very individual. I want to be able to take a picture when we talk about the first day of school. And really customize it yeah. to that, that student. We're going to have a picture of them and their school bus and their teacher. Um, and then we, we kind of quickly learned a lesson that's um, carried us through, I think, till today, which is um, that's a very aspirational thing that people want to do. When it, when it comes down to it, they just they really want us to do it for them. Um, and so that's sort of, I, I, we get into this later, but our ethos is we've done it all for you. We found that people were really just heavily, the feature was good for marketing and people said they wanted it, but they were really heavily using the lessons we created for them. And it makes sense, you yeah. know, if we can give you something that's no prep, of course, you know, who doesn't want that? It's, you know, we're all strapped for time. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do a ton of customer feedback all the time. We're always talking to, to users and uh, through through talking to the app users again and kind of validating Brittany's idea, we did decide that video was the way to go. And so um, we quickly, like, like a year and a half later, launched a video um, subscription service basically that would use video modeling to teach different social skills. Um, for a long time, three or four years, that was just run on a third party service. So it was like, a, it was on Vimeo. So um, we would upload our videos to our channel and we would have like our own channel, but we didn't control any of the software. We didn't build any of the features, anything like that. Um, so there was just some limitations there when you're running on a generic sort of third party service that this like a, a yoga channel is also running on the same service as you. You know, you can't really build the features specific to your users. So um, we decided to build our own self-hosted video solution and then we we're doing some other things which we'll show you we were giving away a lot of worksheets and we were creating web games and sort of using that to generate interest and so we decided to double down on those things as well and really invest heavily in them and make them part of our uh curriculum um so we launched uh what we call the social learning platform or slp it was only just like two years ago, a little over two years ago in August of 2018. It's always shocking to us how fast it seems really slow and really fast at the same time. But um, we've grown a lot since then, even as a company. I mean, you know, at that time there was just four of us and now we're over 30 and, you know, everything, you know, we're, we're a company that's, uh, you know, really a family business. We don't have outside venture capital and that was sort of a choice we made. And so it's, it's been a long process of us, you know, for us, it's been, over six years coming up on seven years now um and then but a lot of that growth has been has been in the last two years so um yeah it, it's made us be really disciplined and really focused on what our users need and want um yeah, why don't we jump into the product yeah. and i'll talk a little bit about video modeling and kind of the research behind that and um how we made you know kind of why we make the content we, the way we do um, so we, you know, we know that video modeling is an evidence-based practice, but we've developed a format, I think, that really makes the most of how you can teach with video. So uh, another thing to think about is with video, it's taking you places that you can't go in real life. So for our students, the ability to see others' thoughts and feelings, we have thought bubbles on screen within our videos, has been a huge, huge uh, turning point in their ability and their social uh, cognition. Um, yeah, so why don't we show a video lesson here? We kind of jump into our curriculum. So it is developed uh, mentally sequenced into skills. And as you get into the skills, um, it opens up goals. And as you get into the goals from here, um, it does go from uh, more emergent all the way through more advanced skills. Um, as you get into the units, um, we have visual supports that you can click on and download or share. Uh, for teletherapy use. We have a little training video from me that's kind of a quick overview. 
And then we have our lesson unit. So all of the materials are put together here in these units for you. And we like to give the therapist a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, you guys know best, uh, depending on what a student needs, you can click into a video, you can click into a game, you can click into an interactive worksheet, which we'll show you what those look like in a bit. Um, and you really, um, you know, somebody already mentioned, you know, what if your session's falling apart, you have the ability to pivot here and quickly kind of jump out and into what your student needs for that day. Yeah. Um, so again, I mentioned, um, you know, making the most of what you can do with a video lesson and the power of video. So um, as we know, our students uh, use visuals to help them understand concepts. So we have everyday speech concepts uh, with our videos on screen. We'll kind of jump around a little bit to highlight some of them, but our videos typically open with an animation. So we're setting the skills up um, and we're breaking them down at the beginning. We use a lot of these visuals too. You can see there, he's really thinking about feelings. We use the highlight on screen to um, put the emphasis on the key terms and key words, key vocabulary that you can pause and can go over with your students. And again, you can really see a lot of these um, visuals. I muted it also, but there is narration happening as yeah. well. So again, here's the skill introduction. Great place to pause, go over again, those key terms, key vocabulary. Uh, kind of do a little mini quiz too and see what your students are understanding and what you really need to work on further. And then we go in, go into the live action. So again, these students are kind of narrating how they're thinking and feeling, really giving you, you know, one, a breakdown. We're slowing down a social interaction in a way that you can't do in real life. It's kind of like you're getting a slow-mo or a replay. Uh, so they can really, really start to dig deep and learn these, um, you know, the different parts of a social interaction and why it's so important to really zoom in here on somebody's face, body language, tone of voice. We break it all down um, and we go over it multiple times. There's a lot of repetition within the videos as well. Here's an example of one of the thought bubbles, as I mentioned. And we've just heard time and time again, uh, having the characters have that inner window to their thoughts and feelings has just really, really helped students make those connections between, well, my behavior has an impact on how others are gonna be thinking about me. And that's really the core and the foundation for any social skill that you're teaching. All right, so that's a lot about our video lessons. Um, and the nice thing is that they all come with accompanying materials too. Um, so in that lesson, you know, we set it up in a quick way too. We kind of mentioned time saving. So here's um, a worksheet that you can just use digitally as well. I often would just, you know, show this on my iPad or you, when you're screen sharing, but you can print it and send it uh, to a student as well, which is again, great for home also. Um, but here in our what to do section, we've really planned out everything for you. So again, really trying to save you guys time and take the prep work out of it. So you can quickly come here and you, you know, in three easy steps, you really know what it is you're going to be doing that day or what your options are. You have the option to do the companion worksheet. You have the option to do a little mini game. Um, and you also could send this home as homework, which is a really nice way just to loop parents into what you're doing that day. Yeah, that's a feature we kind of rapidly built um, in response to the pandemic. So basically any video you can send home um, in telepractice might be relevant to send it to the other side of a, a connection if you wanted to have them view it on their own. But basically it generates a link for you so the student doesn't have to log in. They see a very simplified version where they can't navigate anywhere else on the screen. They can only just watch the video um, that you've sent to them. And then um, we do have the ability to have students and groups as well. So at the end, they can mark it as seen. And then basically, um, we build a list of a, a watch history for the student. So everything that they've seen over the course of the year. So maybe if you have to do some reporting, IEP time, um, you can just kind of click and print. It generates a PDF for you of everything that student has seen and what goals they, they relate to. Awesome. So do we want to jump into um, just quickly, you know, an interactive worksheet? Um, yeah, we can show that. So we, I just want to kind of um, step back and just say, reiterate that. So the platform is really uh, videos or, or activities, which are used to be printable and now are primarily online as well. Um, games and then everyday speech world, which we'll show as well, which is kind of like, honestly, it kind of blurs the line between a video and a game. It's pretty cool. Um, and it's all wrapped into a curriculum. And so we have two curriculums, which we'll get into kind of the future. So right now we're primarily on the, on the special ed side, but we're, we are moving into more um, gen ed as well. 
with, with just gen ed whole class SEL. Um, let's see, what would be a good one? I don't think, but do you want to go into one or just show one? No, I mean. Here, I mean, here you can, can see, see all, all so, the worksheets so we have. <laughs> so this is just back to July of this year. So there's <laughs> over a thousand pieces of material in the platform itself and um, all kind of organized into skills and goals. You can save them into your own lists. Um, you can send them as homework. It's, um, and we have, we have a bunch of different kinds of activities as well. So everything from, you know, I just have five minutes left. I just want to run a role play or have a discussion. We have discussion prompts to kind of like a full packet, something that you might see on like teachers pay teachers to something like this, which is more of like a student led mm -hmm. um, worksheet that you could send to them to print out. We also have um, digital versions of, of a whole bunch of worksheets as well. Um, but just in the interest of time, I we should. Um, <laughs> get him, get and, then, going. and then we also have a whole bunch of web games. And so um, these are super popular, especially in telepractice. Everyone is sort of doing telepractice now, but mm -hmm. um, like social skills quiz show, this is just like a Jeopardy style game at all the different skills you could think of. So um, self-regulation and problem solving and um, communication skills. Uh, I think the one we really want to show is the everyday speech world. Um, as we mentioned, this sort of blurs the line between a video and a game. So I'll jump back to the world later, but basically, um, if you remember the game, The Sims, it's very similar to that where there's like an open world and you walk around and then you interact with um, characters in the world. So right here, we're in the classroom and this is just, again, this is working on the first skill in our curriculum, identifying feelings. Um, and this is just basically you interacting with sort of as close as we can get to a real person. Um, so here, let me click on one person and you just start. I have the video muted. Um, but there would be audio, you're hearing what they're saying, you know, your student is playing as that little avatar that they've gotten uh, to select before the game started. And now they're thinking, well, how am I going to respond to this person? What would be the best thing to say? And we also ask them, what would be the worst thing to say? And then on top of that, we ask, what would be kind of a so-so response? And from those three choices, I just feel as a therapist, you really get a meaty, lengthy discussion there, thinking through. And I already mentioned, um, make, take, learning about the consequences, the social consequences of our actions is really at the core of social skills. So being able to understand that if I say this, how is somebody going to think? And then I can infer, okay, that's not a good choice to make. I'm going to do something else. So we feel like this really helps them see those pathways in a really visual way. And one thing we're able to really do here is um, kind of get at, at nuance and how maybe the words that they're saying don't match the message in their tone and body language. And so, you know, this person might be saying, they are, they are saying, yes, they can help you, but it's clear from her body language. And if you kind of read between the lines that she's not super interested in helping. Um, and so if, if I just said, thanks, I really need that, need the help. That's probably not the best answer. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to choose this as the best answer. And so I say that back and then I get to, um, kind of guess how that made the person feel. Yep. We play through how they're going to respond. And here again, we're seeing those thought bubbles and, uh, we call these our social emojis. These we used within all of our videos, um, many, many games and activities. You're able to just download all of them also in one go if you want, because there's just so many fun uses for these and students seem to really love them. So maybe she's not feeling worried. Let's see, she's feeling relieved. Uh, and then we get her thought bubble as well. So you can kind of check your answer and she's explaining why she felt this way. And then so you, you would go through and then you could um, you kind of select the worst response and then the middle response. And often, you know, the discussion about like if a student disagrees with the right, the mm -hmm. best or worst responses, that's great for conversation and, you know, a great, a great talking point, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're really able to have those lengthy discussions with your students and really talk about those social behaviors. So back here's the little world that you're navigating around. So I was just in this um understanding feelings, but I could come over here and do this little level here as well. So we have um, modules on lots of the everyday speech concepts, well, which you'll get to learn and hopefully love as you go through the curriculum, but conversation drivers and stoppers is one of them. So we have video lessons, games, activities, all about, well, what's a conversation driver? It's actions that keep a conversation going. And conversation stopper, you can imagine, are actions that sometimes our students unknowingly do, and it stops the conversation. Great. 
Okay, so just to get back to the curriculums, I wanted yeah. to show that again. So we do have a, what we call the social communication curriculum. So that's on the special ed side. And I just wanna quickly do a preview of the general ed um, SEL curriculum, which we sort of soft launch at the beginning of the school year. And we're, we're starting to do beta testing and pilot programs with school districts um, to get feedback on our materials. Um, so you'll notice it's much more rigid um, and kind of laid out for you than our social communication curriculum, which has a ton of content adaptable to really anyone's needs. For the SEL curriculum, general ed, we're really coming in, you know, knowing that it may be an educator who had this thrown on their lap and they're, they're not trained for this or they don't understand the value of it. And so what we really wanted to do is kind of reduce those barriers to teaching it. So you can imagine if your district or, you know, your, your organization says you have to teach SEL and then throws a whole bunch of theory and workbooks at you that you have to work your way through to understand how to even teach it. We really just wanted somebody to be inside the product and teaching within minutes. Um, so that's how we set up the SEL curriculum. So it's just 40 weeks of um, one lesson a week and it, it sort of maps right to the castle um, competencies. Yep. Exactly. So we really wanted to take the, you know, the power of the video lessons that we've seen in the digital curricula and really, again, empower any teacher or professional um, that needs to teach SEL. Um, you know, we are seeing that, you know, now more than ever, students are really needing social emotional learning, um, you know, not only with the pandemic happening in the world, um, but a lot of other things that were happening in the U.S. Um, so thinking about equity and teaching SEL um, and instilling social justice into our educational systems, um, you know, for all of those reasons, SEL is really, really important. Um, and again, students just need it now more than ever. And we're seeing initiatives in schools where they're being asked to teach it. But again, they, they might be getting, you know, professional development days where they're getting some frameworks thrown at them, but they might not be getting the materials that they can actually use to get up and running. Um, so that's what we really wanted to do here. Um, so as you see, we started with elementary. We've broken it into early and elementary and you go through the weeks, you're given video lessons, you're giving accompanying, accompanying follow-up materials, um, a lot of discussions and group activities you could do as a whole class. Um, and again, with a lot of the features on the product side of our social skills curriculum, so the ability to send it as homework, the ability to use um, digital activities on screen. Here's a quick sample of what it looks like. Some of those follow-up activities that follow up the video lessons. Um, again, uh, Cal mentioned that we are aligning to the CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning uh, frameworks and five competencies. As you kind of run through um, the curriculum, you see that. Oops. But we also follow, Cal mentioned um, our ethos of we've done it all for you. And that's really evident in all of the lessons as well. Actually, when you click into a lesson, you are getting you know, a brief overview of what this lesson is. You're getting week by week, the most important um, overview of what you're teaching and why you're teaching it. And then as you click on a lesson, you're also getting a teacher script. So what you would be saying to your students um, to introduce the activity. Um, yeah, so as you can kind of see again, um, thinking about the castle frameworks, the materials themselves, it's a heavy emphasis on problem solving, coping with emotions, um, dealing with anxiety. You saw that um, lesson is called choosing calm, um, relationships with others. So showing empathy, working on a team, being a good sport, relationship building, um, to have positive interactions with peers and adults in your life. Um, and you know, a core tenant of SEL also is um, bridging the gap between school and home and community. And so again, all of these materials have the same feature on our social skills curriculum side to send home. Yep. Great. Yeah. So um, just to wrap up on the product, sort of where we're going is one is closing that gap between school and home. So more send home materials, possibly a way for uh, increasing the access that students have, you know, sort of with reducing the barriers. So making it available on a cell phone and you don't have to have a laptop or, or an iPad to be able to access the materials. Um, and just continuing the, the we've done it all for you ethos with potentially thinking about um, data tracking and assessment. So that's all stuff that's sort of on our radar. And then one kind of more interesting thing, which relates a lot to everyday speech world um, is, taking a video experience from being um, passive to active or interactive. And so we're thinking a lot about how, um, you know, 
we have a lot of pausing for discussion for students in the video, but it's reliant on the educator to be there and pause and have that discussion. And so, you know, we're kind of taking, we, our idea is to kind of take our, our experts in SEL, Brittany being one of them, and make it feel like they're sitting there in the chair next to you, guiding you through the lesson. So not only educating you maybe beforehand with training materials, that's kind of something we hear from districts all the time. That's like their number one thing is I need to train people how to teach SEL, but how can you build that into the product too? So, um, you know, our video player is just like any other piece of software and you can interact with it. So um, rather than asking a discussion question, and asking the educator to pause, we can automatically pause the video for you and pop up a, a question, or we can throw some of those matching activities on the screen. So while you're going in the lesson, you have to respond and sort of interact before the video continues, things like that. So we're really looking to take that interactivity to a new level. And I think everyday speech world is the, is the first step to that. Okay, great. Um, so we're just going to jump back in just with the, the last slide, which is just kind of how you can find us. So let me um, share my screen back to the PowerPoint here. Um, so this is everything we just talked about, but yeah, basically um, we're at everydayspeech.com. Um, you can try out our platform. There's a 30 day free trial. We work with educators to get POs from districts and organizations. Um, you can always contact us. So our main customer support is just info at everyday speech, or you can email Brittany and I directly just Cal at everyday speech or Brittany at everyday speech.com. Um, super flexible. We work with a ton of telepractice clinicians all the time. And like I said, the world is telepractice right now. So we're, we're very comfortable kind of in this world and, um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's us. That's the product. So thank you. Appreciate it. I like have that moment when you like, like I said earlier, when I introduced you guys, it's so fun to see someone who loves what they do and then see someone who's passionate, so passionate about it that they find ways to like share it and not just, oh, I just feel so good. Just that share and like experience and share it and empower people. And I, you can definitely see that theme in just everything on everyday speech. So I thought that it was just brilliant. We do have a little Q and A right here. Um, if you do have a question, can you please put into the chat? And then that way we can ask the questions out. Um, if our panelists will go ahead and turn on their videos that keep themselves muted, they'll be able to see some of the questions and respond to them. I do have a couple questions that we had from clinicians prior to this. These ones are directed at Cal and Brittany. Um, the first question that I had from a clinician was, um, and I think that you even did answer this, but I'm going to re-ask it, is when you have a student who is just not, not in that session, um, how do you redirect it using everyday speech? Sure. So yes, I, I kind of hit on that a little bit, um, but because our lesson units are built out in that four step um, progression, you, I really think it would be super, super uh, easy to just, you know, you have sample material right next to you that's aligned to, you know, the topic that you're working on, but you could pivot and say, okay, this just is not working out right now. You know, for whatever reason, we're not going to do this worksheet. We are going to switch right to the game. Like maybe you were planning on doing the game at the end of the session for, you know, five or 10 minutes, but you might say, okay, you know what, we're going to jump right into it. And the way we've designed all of our materials is built to be very, very flexible as well, just because I have that experience. I know what it feels like when you're in a session and you just completely need to pivot. So our games have settings um, to do, you know, one player, many player, um, short rounds versus long rounds. So they're meant to really um, at the outset of when you have your session, you can really click and say, okay, I, I want to do a really long in-depth game. I really want to see where my students are and have to give them some more practice opportunities right now. So we're going to do 20 full min minutes on this game. Or you could say, okay, I just want to do the speed round. We have five minutes. It's a fun reward. We're just going to do it that way. And again, knowing our students and, you know, to avoid uh, meltdowns, if you will, uh, a lot of the games have the opportunity to save the game as well. So you can say, okay, don't worry, we're going to save progress and we're going to come back to it next week, hopefully saving you guys um, a little bit of distress and the students. I see another question in the chat. This looks like, and Erin, you took off your thing too. Did you have something to tag on to that? did. I just wanted to say that the build emoji game has saved 
so many sessions for me because it's if there has been a time where a student is having a really tough time, it's usually when um, if they're possibly triggered by what we're talking about or they realize because of a, a thought bubble maybe how their behavior has impacted someone, we can use the build emoji game to go back and talk about, and they can build it to show either how they are feeling in that moment or how they've maybe made someone else feel. And it seems to just kind of like regroup things and we can move on from there. That's one of my favorite tools. Oh, that's a really cool way to use that. I feel like I haven't actually really thought about using it in that way. So that's really cool to hear. Yeah, build emoji is just a game where you know you add your own eyes, nose, mouth, and the shade of the character. So You're maybe building the, out those social emojis yeah, that we mentioned. Maybe a shade of red or something like that. <laughs> I think that's great. Um, I like this next question. It's here, and it's um, how long would an average lesson take for regular ed, SEL? What's the average length of a lesson? Sure. So, yep, we design we designed the SEL lessons to be thirty minutes. Um, so once a week. And again, because we've built, you know, I really try to make everything flexible and f to fit the educators needs. And I know that they're going to change <laughs> on the day to day. So uh, there's a lot of group discussion and group activities. We really wanted to work in that social interaction piece. So you could go through, um, if you remember when we showed the follow-up companion activity to the video lesson for the SEL, there were tabs on screen and there were, um, there could be anywhere from three to five activities. And you as the educator have the choice. So you can say, okay, we have a little more time today. We're going to do all five. Or you can say, you know, we're only going to hit one. And then you also have um, in the what to do section where we lay out um, what you should be doing. We have a couple bonus discussions in there and that's, you know, optional. You can do that if you have the time or you can say, we're, you know, we're just going to watch the lesson and then, you know, move on to this the next week. Another question I see in there is how can we give our computer control over to our students so they can have interaction on some of those games? Yeah, I think it depends on what screen sharing tool you use. Mm -hmm. So like on Zoom, for example, you can give mouse control. Um, so it really is up to kind of whatever third party system that you're using um, to, to do that. You could also, um, I mean, if you really wanted to, you could also send the game as homework and, you know, see if the student was doing it on their end. Might not work in every, every situation. So I would say the best thing to do is just use the native screen sharing and mouse control that's built into tools like Zoom. And I think Google Meet has it now, and a few different ones have it. And Megan, I saw you nodding your head a lot with that question. Do you have some experience with that? Yep, Zoom is really, really easy to allow the um, students to come in and work through um, whatever we're working on. And um, that save feature is a lifesaver, FYI. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do one more tech in the chat. We'll do a last call for questions. If you have another question put in the chat so we can ask our panelists. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. I just enjoyed tonight so much. Another like, everyone do like a silent round of applause, snap through your fingers for everyone who shared, a little celebration for Cal and Brittany for being so prepared and sharing. I like was listening to some of those videos and I was like, oh, I should probably also work my way through that course as well. So I just am so thankful for everything you've put together. So thank you everyone and have a good evening. Thank you guys. Thank you.